Hello, I'm Helen from the Seeing Data project team. On Seeing Data, we researched how people interact with data visualisations. You can find out about the project on our website, seeingdata.org. In this video, I'm going to talk about how a visualisation is made, because this can affect how you engage with the visualisation. A number of decisions and processes go into making visualisations. These involve a range of people, including the people who want the visualisation to be made, the people making it, and other people in between. These decisions and processes relate to how to gather and represent the data, and other things too, like who the audience will be and where the visualisation will be shown and seen. First, let's talk about gathering data. The data on which visualisations are based are gathered in particular conditions. What ends up in a data set depends on things like what kind of data can be accessed, what tools are used to gather them, and who is doing the data gathering. Who is gathering the data matters because, as many writers have pointed out, gathering data involves interpretation, for example about what counts as good or relevant data. The subjective assumptions of the data gatherer play a role in the data gathering process. What data are gathered for also matters. Data are often gathered to answer particular questions or in response to certain curiosities. This means I might gather data from this particular source but not from that source because I don't think those data are relevant to the questions I want to answer. Some writers like Gittleman and Jackson argue that the term raw data implies that data are objective, truthful and factual. But we can see that this isn't the case. Data come into being in particular situations which shape what they're like. The visualisation designer needs to think about the following things. Who is commissioning the visualisation? That is, who wants the visualisation to be made and what requirements do they have? Who is the audience? What do they want or need to know? What do they already know about the subject matter? Are they interested in the subject matter? Where will the visualisation be published? Is it for the web, a presentation or for a printed report? Once data has been collected and it's clear who wants the visualisation and what they want it for, further decisions have to be taken by the person producing the visualisation. This means asking questions about the analysis and the visualisation of the data. What story is emerging from the data? Is there enough data or do more need to be collected? Which elements of the data should be presented? What's the most appropriate chart type? What units and scales should be used? What colours, fonts, shapes and layouts work best? Should it be interactive or static and how should interactivity work? Should explanatory or instructional text be included? What should it say? Should narrative accompany the visualisation to tell the story? How much information, if any, should be included about the data and the creation of the visualisation? How designers answer these questions has an impact on the visualisation that we eventually get to see. Designers base their decisions on a range of different things. Many visualisation designers have studied and learnt about best practices in visual design and data handling. They keep up to date with best practice by reading blogs, going to visualisation conferences and talking to other experts in the field. All of the visualisation professionals who we interviewed on our Seeing Data project are committed to doing good with data. That's the motto of this US-based visualisation agency, Periscopic. This means making it easy for people to understand data by visualising them. But even though designers are committed to doing good with data, the processes and questions that I've mentioned so far mean that they can't present us with a neutral window onto data. Here is visualisation designer and Seeing Data team member Andy Kirk talking about the choices he made when working on a visualisation about psychotherapy in the Arctic. The data was collected by the client himself and it's quite a small data set, only about 50 records over a couple of years and not an entire population of all the patients who are in treatment, but it's a sample size that would give us an indication of the possible improvements and or deteriorations that took place. So of course there are many other chart types we could have used. We could have shown how things have changed over time, we could have shown how things relate to each other hierarchically. But the chart types that we chose really 
portray the key angles of what we want to show people. The counts, the quantitative, the categorical counts, using the bar chart and using the, the single dimension scatter plot. The scatter plot itself, the main device in that, single, in that graphic overall, shows the relationship between two variables. And that was a really key thing that we want to show. There are many other devices that could show relationships that didn't quite get the essence of what we did want to portray. And then the slope graph is a brilliant device for a before and after story. So there are always many charts that are out there possibly that could be used, even in simple straightforward data sets. But we felt that these were the best ones that really captured what we wanted to show people. And finally the arrangement, how we position, size and arrange all the different elements in the, in the graphic. The charts, the titles, the sections, the title, the introductions. The placement is deliberately designed to ensure that the narrative, the stream, the flow of the content makes sense to the reader and that we can navigate them through the story and that's an important part of visualisation design. The main constraints we were facing in this project were the audience types, the limitation of the data in terms of how deep and how big the, the volume of the data was and also the format. The audience type had to be quite varied. We had to reach experts right the way through to lay people. The Fart restrictions being print meant that we couldn't, in this case, create a web version that allowed manipulation and interrogation of the data. That would have been another nice spin-off version of the project. Designers who we interviewed as part of our research talked about the role that intermediaries, people in between the person making the visualisation and the person commissioning it, play in shaping a visualisation. Intermediaries can include newspaper editors or the people in legal departments of the organisations commissioning the visualisations. These people make sure that everything published in the name of their organisation, including data visualisations, is in keeping with the perspective, style and tone of voice of the organisation. If visualisers want to get paid, they need to adhere to guidelines and this can affect which visualisations get made too. Like the idea of raw data, visualisations can appear to be objective or truthful. Some of the conventions for displaying data play a role in creating this impression. For example, it's common for visualisations to use two-dimensional viewpoints, such as a front-on view, like graphs that use an x-y axis, or a top-down view, like maps and pie charts. Two experts on visual communication, Kress and Van Leuven, argue that using a front-on or top-down view hides the perspective behind the visualisation. This means that, quote, distortions that usually come with perspective are neutralised. Although these views look objective, they disguise the perspective that lies behind them. The fact that many of us are unaware of the decisions that have been made in producing a visualisation and the role of intermediaries can strengthen this feeling that visualisations are factual. This is true of other types of media and things that have been designed. Most designers would agree that this is the case. In our interviews, visualisation designers acknowledge that when making a visualisation, they make decisions about what not to show as well as what to show. They also said that people looking at visualisations need to look critically and question what is shown to them. They shouldn't simply trust visualisations because they're based on numbers and therefore appear factual or truthful. So the visualisations that we see in our newspapers, on TV, on social media and elsewhere are the result of a long process. A lot of thinking and decision making lies behind a visualisation.